I am delighted to be spending the next uh, 45 minutes or so with you all in sharing about my enthusiasm for modeling in general. And now with COVID, it's really epidemiological modeling of COVID-19. So I'm an associate professor of biology at Spelman College. I see that we're very well represented here between Dr. Sistrunk, who is my colleague, who just gave a wonderful overview and um, uh, really nice insights by uh, Jessica Coates, who is a former student of mine. So very happy to, to be here and the fact that Spelman is well represented. Um, so um, you, we heard a lot epidemiological modeling lately. We heard a lot about the things that it could do uh, or you know, things that could have been avoided. So for example, you know, headlines in the Washington Post such as uh, shutdowns prevented 60 million coronavirus infections in the US, study finds. We hear about all the different models that are out there and uh, how they give very, very different results from one another. Uh, in particular, we mostly hear about that IHME, the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation out of uh, Washington State. That's the one that's also used by the White House to do a lot of predictions. But even this model is adjusted on a regular basis. And as you can see on this chart, you know, the outcomes predicted by, for June 3rd, July 7th, August 6th, September 2nd, and so on, kind of um, are very different. And on the left, I have a screenshot of uh, the current um, uh, epidemic. It's a screenshot that was taken just a few days ago. And as you can see, the way the epidemic was running its course in the United States, it has kind of these three waves. We are into this third wave now. And right now we're recording a little over 200,000 cases a day. And so why are we seeing these different waves? Why does it not look like, you know, that bell curve, uh, theoretical uh, epidemic curve that we might expect? So we're going to try to dig deeper, one layer deeper into epidemiological modeling to be able to make sense of why are these outcomes very different or what predictions can be, be made using epidemiological modeling and how does reality connect with the, the models? And so what I'm going to do is to introduce you to the very first epidemiological model uh, that was developed back in the 1920s, late 20s, and it's called the SIR model. And so S stands for susceptible, I stands for infected, and R stands for recovery. And so, before I get to the SIR model, what is exactly a model? A model is a simplified description of a complex entity or process. Oftentimes in a model, you make many assumptions and simplifications. That's really the core of what a model is. You know, it's not reality. You're not trying to capture completely 100% reality, which would be impossible but rather you have a simplified version of a complex uh, entity or process. And of course you uh, have uh, you build in assumptions and simplifications. But most importantly, what's really important about a model is its utility. Uh, if it's not useful, then what's the point of having your model? And so the utility is to understand the process, uh, understand mechanisms involved, and also be able to predict or project. And as you can imagine in public health, being able to predict or pro project things like, you know, how many ICU beds do we need? How is this epidemic going to run its course? When do we expect, you know, maximum peak for the number of infected people? What are the different public health measures we should impl implement to prevent it running its course, you know, freely and, and uh, taking lives and so on. Um, and again, I want to emphasize that whenever you're modeling, you're always making assumptions and simplifications, and therefore all models are wrong, but some are useful. So uh, this is a, a few words that are 
regularly used by modelers and statisticians because again, uh, the utility of a model is uh, how you kind of design and build your model. So you have to build it in such a way that it can answer the questions you have in mind. So you cannot um, circumvent certain simplifications or assumptions uh, depending on your purpose. And so the classic SIR model is one where you have a, you know, the way we think about an epidemic and the way we think about a given population, a finite population, is you have a group of susceptible people and you might have a pool or group of infected people and a group of uh, uh, people who have recovered from the infection. Uh, so they are no longer susceptible and new, typically they have built immunity. Um, so uh, we think about people moving from the susceptible at the beginning of an epidemic, everybody's susceptible in our, an epidemic we've never seen before like COVID-19, 100% of the population is susceptible. You throw in there, you know, you see from overseas or, um, you know, maybe uh, through a person being infected from an animal, um, you have now, let's say, one infected person, and now that one infected person can uh, spread the disease to all these susceptible people. And then as you, uh, as more and more infected people join this group, they are more likely to infect more and more of the susceptible people. And you have gradually some of these infected people moving into the recovered pool, you know, typically for COVID, uh, it might take, you know, 10 days or so before they're no longer uh, infectious. And so it's a, also called a compartment model because, you know, people flow from one compartment or pool to the next. And if you have, uh, you typically think in terms of a finite population. So the number of susceptible people plus the number of infected plus the recovered uh, make up 100% of the population or uh, uh, the proportions add up to one. Uh, so far, so good. So I'll continue. So I'm going to be asking some questions, uh, chat questions. So I'll expect people to drop in some answers in the chat as I move along. So here, um, uh, this is a representation of the healthy or susceptible people. So at the beginning of the pandemic, 100% of the population is all healthy. And once you have uh, one infected or sick person, uh, as these healthy people are being infected, their proportion in the population declines and it can go technically all the way to zero. Um, the number of sick people increases over time up to a point. Uh, and usually that point is when you have 50% of the healthy people who have um, been sick and infected. And then eventually it starts to go down, it starts to wind down. And uh, gradually the number of immune or recovered people uh, starts to go up. So uh, usually when you see curves, epidemiological curves, you only see the sick people, the green one, you don't see the healthy and the immune, but um, we also know that uh, that's how they evolve. So uh, to kind of really get a quantitative handle on this model, typically um, we look at the change of the infected people. For example, the change of the infected pool is going to be a function of new infections. So if there are a lot of people who are being infected, then the pool of infected people is going to increase uh, and then eventually some uh, recover. So whenever, uh, so this is a question for you all. This is gonna be a chat question. How would the pool of infected people change? Would it increase or decrease if um, there are uh, more infections than recovery? So again, here's my pool of infected people. Um, if you have um, more infections than recoveries, how would this pool change? 
Okay, I see lots of answers. Increase, increase, wonderful, wonderful. Excellent, excellent. Okay, excellent. So yeah, if there's more infections than there are recoveries, the number of infected people will uh, increase. Okay, now I want you all to think about um, factors that might increase infections or factors that might decrease infections. So I'm going to give you another minute. So what could possibly increase infections or more specifically the rate of infections? What can sort of drive infections? And what factors might decrease the rate of infections? So I see lack of PP, gatherings, population density, excellent, no social distancing, virus mutation. Oh, this is wonderful. <laughs> this is great. Quarantining, a lack of masks, no preventive measures. Excellent. You're all on target on this one. So yeah, so it's pretty intuitive to uh, think about some of the factors that drive infections. So you talked about mostly about um, factors that affect disease transmission. So uh, a lot of the answers I've seen in the chat are uh, factors that affect disease transmission. So if you're not wearing masks, if you're gathering, crowding, if you're not social distancing and so on, that will increase um, rates of infection. If you're, you know, if nurses and especially medical hospital is not using PPE, that would all increase infections. Uh, but also, uh, I saw things like density. Uh, so if there's a lot of crowding, uh, especially if there is, the number of infected people is high, uh, then you can imagine that it would also drive infections, right? People can gather, but if hardly anybody in the community is infected, then the rate of infection is not going to be high. But if people can gather in, there are a lot of infected people going around, then that would also really drive the rate of infection. Uh, and then if you think about the pool of susceptibles right now with COVID, we're at the beginning of the epidemic. Um, if you really look at the population, there is about, I think, um, 18 million people who've had COVID. Uh, U.S. population is 330 million or so. So it's, um, so most people are still susceptible, right? We haven't even reached 10% of people who have been infected or recovered. And so the vast majority of people are susceptible, but sometimes when you think that, you know, if you are towards the end of an epidemic, after an epidemic has run its course, maybe, uh, you know, things can be the opposite where you have maybe 10% of the population that's still susceptible and 90% um, that might be recovered, in which case there are not very many susceptible people to, to be infected and therefore kind of the rate of infection slows down as well. So this is great. You're all on target uh, in kind of getting a good feel for what drives infections. And now let's talk about recoveries. What, can, what factors can uh, increase or decrease the rate of recovery. So I'm looking for chat answers. Oh, I see another question I'll address later about HIV. So death, um, okay. So, okay, so excellent. So prior conditions, okay, excellent. Changing definitions of active cases, improvement of symptoms. Uh, what kind of medical interventions can possibly uh, help you recover faster? Right. So, for example, you know, you might have heard about this drug called remdesivir. So, if remdesivir was available to a lot of infected people, it might speed up recovery. Now, there are a couple of in interesting uh, questions dropped in. 
where how does this SIR model look like for HIV? So this is a very generic model where we assume that there's only three pools, the susceptible, the infected, and the recovered. Uh, and with HIV, what we know is that because HIV mostly affects the immune system itself, the immune system isn't really not quite able to mount a, a long-term um, immunity. And so they never really, really reach that, reach that recovered state. Uh, and so they, they remain infected and infectious. Of course, I'm talking about the beginning of the HIV epidemics now. Well, and there are really some good drugs where the viral load is much lower. So people are infected. Uh, they're never really recovered, but they're not infectious neither. And so this model would look a little bit different where you would have you go from susceptible to maybe infectious and then um, um, kind of, um, I don't know what they would call it. Um, you're no longer infectious, but you might be, uh, you're not totally recovered either. We also know that it's a disease um, that takes a long time to sort of, the progression of the disease is slow. And so oftentimes you add another actually pool of people who might be exposed, but not infectious yet, and so on. And so you can immediately grasp then that this model needs to be tweaked depending on the disease and how it runs its course. Uh, if you have you know, susceptible, infected or recovered, or you know, if you have to slightly adjust to different pools. Oftentimes you also have people who recover but you may not be recovered forever. For example, with COVID-19, it's only been around for about a year. So we don't know if people are going to be immune to the disease for the rest of their life, or maybe they might lose that immunity after a year, two years, three years, we don't know exactly. So sometimes there are models where you have a trickle down from the recovered pool towards the susceptible pool. Okay, so there's a lot of chat questions that came in as I was talking, but hopefully uh, Dr. Chin might kind of bring them back up again uh, as we, towards the end. So, so if there were any drugs that could speed recoveries, they would um, uh, increase, for example, the recovery rate. Right now with COVID, people become uh, sick for about, um, they kind of wouldn't leave that infected pool for a good week to 10 days or so for most people. But I also saw a question about long COVID, um, are they infectious or not? So from what I understand, a lot of people who are uh, long holders, the virus is gone. So when they get tested, they're, they no longer carry the virus. So they're no longer infectious. Um, but their recovery is not you know, 100%. They might still have lingering symptoms and damage has been done to many organs already. And so the recovery is excessively slow. Okay. And so now you kind of instinctively understand um, the, the dynamics going on here. And uh, so, okay, just to wrap up again. So recoveries, all factors affecting recovery from disease, such as drugs, for example, would uh, positively affect it, but also the number of infected people. So the more infected people you have, the, you know, the more recovered people you'll have, right? If nobody's infected, then you may not have any people recovering. Uh, and so that was really kind of understanding sort of the dynamics uh, in the model. And next step really is to simply uh, express that in the form of an equation. So at any given time, the number of infected people is going to be a factor of new infections, so the number of new infections, and the minus the number of recoveries. Uh, and the number of new infections will depend both on the number of infected people. The more infected people you have, the more they're likely to mingle with susceptible people and infect them. Uh, also depends on the susceptible pool again, because 
the number of uh, the more you have susceptible people in the population, the more likely you are to generate infections, infected people. And then here, this is what you guys um, chat answers really gravitated around, which is the transmission parameter. How transmissible is this disease? Uh, and of course, as you all said in your chat, this transmission parameter depends on um, all those public health measures you mentioned, such as wearing masks, social distancing, quarantining, et cetera. And so it's not just a one, uh, one number, that number will vary on uh, people's behavior and a collective behavior. So this is sort of the new infections and then the recoveries uh, are gonna be dependent on the recovery parameter. Uh, typically that recovery parameter is dependent on the disease duration. So if do we shorten or, uh, you know, if we can shorten the disease duration, then recoveries are going to be uh, a little faster. The rate of recoveries is going to be a little faster. And of course, it will depend on the number of infected people. So the more infected people are present in that pool, the more uh, recovered people uh, will move into that next pool. So mathematically, this is quite simple. This is uh, behind the scenes of the SIR model. So this is for calculating the number of infected people. If we also want to calculate how the number of susceptible people is going to uh, evolve over time, as well as the number of recovered people uh, evolve over time, the number of susceptible people is simply, you know, uh, decreased by the number of infections. So how quickly do you move them out? You know, that depends on the number of infections. And so again, it's that same term, beta, I, and S, the infected and the susceptible. And for the covered people, the number of recovered people at any given time is going to be a factor of recoveries, which is then also a factor of recovery rate times the number of infected people. So once we have these mathematical equations, we can put them in a little program and this is what I've just uh, done. Um, and what we did was uh, we did a Python script that uses these three equations to calculate the number of susceptible, infected, and recovered over time. Uh, and uh, this one was, we were giving it um, a try to model uh, a college campus with a finite population of 600 first year students. This was going to be actually the scenario at Spelman College last fall. Um, in the summer, we were debating whether we were gonna bring uh, only first year students or half of our student population and so on. So, but in the end, we went 100% virtual, but this was going to be the scenario to, to contend with. So uh, college campus with 600 first year students and their they might be tested before coming on campus, but one might have been missed. And so we have one infected student and then the rest and the 599 are susceptible at the start of the semester and nobody is recovered. And so now I'm gonna switch screens and um, Go to this script. So to model that scenario, we had a Python script. And so a little later, you're all going to be doing some coding. Uh, it's gonna be R, but most, uh, most script will have the structure at the beginning. You'll have typically your parameters including, for example, for us, the parameters that we care the most about, these are our initial conditions. We initially had 600 susceptible students, uh, zero infected and uh, zero recovered. And you know, here is just the plotting of the uh, graphical output. Uh, and then here, this, these are the calculations for the values of the susceptible, the infected and the recovered over time. 
I'm not going to go too much into the details at this point, but I really point out to these parameters we're interested in, initial conditions we're interested in, as well as these parameters, such as the recovery rate, the number of days that the infection lasts, the transmission. So N600 here is our population si uh, size. Tau is the probability of an infected person to infect another healthy person and so on. So anyways, I'll just go ahead and run it with our susceptibles being 600 of them. And when I run this program, I see that I have 600 susceptible people. The, in blue and in red, those two lines overlap they are at uh, zero all the time of, for all the duration of the simulation. So we run the simulations for <clears throat> 50 days. And here, total here is the number of people. So now I just go back to my program and to simulate our first scenario, which is that one student is infected, I just edit my script to uh, 599 susceptible, one infected. As I run the program, this is what I get. Um, the number of susceptible people declines over time. Uh, in green, we have the number of infected people that goes up and then the recovered eventually uh, goes up like that. And again, this is where you have, for example, the peak at about um, 10 or 11 days. That's when you have the peak of infection with, you know, and here it's at about 220 or so uh, infected students on campus. And so if the campus had set aside, let's say 50 beds for quarantining students, that capacity would be exceeded actually very quickly up at this point, at about six days into the semester. <laughs> and so this is kind of one way to, to um, um, simulate a lot of different scenarios using this SIR model. Um, one of the things we can model, for example, is what happens if the, um, the students wear masks. So that's going to change the probability of um, an infected person uh, infecting others. So we might decrease this probability from Point two, which means 20%, right? If two people meet and there's not one person infected, there's 20% chance that the other person would be infected. If they're wearing masks, maybe let's see if it's just 10%. Let's see how this program is going to look like. Looks very, very different, right? Instead of peaking at 10 or 11 days, now we're peaking at um, here at um, 25, 26 days. So the outcome is going to be very different. And this is, if you recall, this is all about flattening the curve, right? Uh, implementing certain uh, public health policies so that the infection is, uh, keeps going unabated. Um, Hong, I see there's some people dropping in chats. If I need to interrupt, let me know. Okay, so this was a scenario where people are wearing masks. Um, so maybe now we're not wearing masks. I go back to point two transmission probability, but if the average number of people a person is in contact with per day, and instead of being five, people are really quarantining and are only seeing maybe three people, another three people a day, how would this look like? So again, um, if they see three people instead of five, but not wearing masks, this is how it looked like. So you see a lot of different outcomes depending on um, the, the kind of the public health measures that might be implemented. And then finally, uh, I would like to uh, think about, you know, what happens now, instead of having 600 susceptible students, some students are vaccinated or half of the student population is vaccinated. You know, let's say in the spring, you're going into spring, uh, a lot of students come back on campus, but half of them might be vaccinated. In which case, we're not going to have 600 susceptible people, but rather have that many because the other half would be vaccinated. 
And so I dropped that 600 to, to 300. And, you know, and maybe, you know, one way to think about vaccination is to put them maybe in that pool of recovered people. Um, so that's a, one way that we can simulate it. There are a couple of different ways of going about it. So what would it look like? Totally, totally different, right? Um, oh, wait a second. Let me see if my, okay, here, I'm going to go back to my original um, number of people that each person is in contact with. This is how it's going to look like. So we start off with half the student population that's vaccinated. So um, 300 of them are vaccinated. So they're already in the recovery in the blue line. And then half of them are still susceptible. And so um, a few of them will get infected, but you know you don't have that dramatic peak of infection. So hopefully you kind of enjoyed a little bit of that modeling and, what, and have a sense of what modeling can do for you, how you can simulate to different scenarios, uh, how you can, um, how this can be actually a very useful tool for um, public health purposes in predicting and managing diseases. So now kind of going back to all the assumptions and simplifications. So in this particular case, you know, with 600 college students, we assume that it's a closed system that, um, you know, these students typically in real life, students are not in a prison when they're in a college campus, they can go in and out and some others who may not be college students on that campus can come in and out. So it's not fully a closed system. Um, um, also in epidemics that run over long periods of times, you might have to account, uh, take into account birth and death and so on. If you think about this uh, at the national level, you know, there's no state or continent of the country like the United States where you can completely ban travel. There's always some movement. So for as long as there are people out there in the world that have the coronavirus, it's very possible that it might come back. Um, in this particular case with the SIR model, we assume no latency. So at the minute you've been exposed to an infected person, you become infectious as well, which is not always true. We also assume that immunity is complete. We know that for many diseases, immunity is not complete. It kind of winds down. Um, so uh, one has to make adjustments to these models. And you know, to the point that Dr. Strunk was making earlier, we also make the assumption that all races are equally infected. Um, but we actually know that populations actually have many different subpopulations. Uh, and for the coronavirus, we know that communities are of color are more likely to be infected. And so you can really tweak the models to take into account any of these aspects. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, for example, you can have um, you can take into account the different natural histories of the disease, uh, such as, for example, coming up with an SIS model rather than SIR model, you'd have susceptibles that can become infected. And then from infected, instead of going back to recovered, you can go back to susceptible. Or this is actually the more uh, most often used model, the SEIR, where you have susceptibles. Then they enter that pool of exposed people, but they're not yet infectious. And then they become infectious uh, and, and, and are really oftentimes displaying symptoms and then becoming getting into the recovered pool. With COVID, we also know that there might be some demographic characteristics that affect the, um, the course of the disease, such as age, sex, or race. There are also very different behavioral categories, uh, especially these days we hear the world essential workers. So people who might be more at risk because they, they are in contact with a lot of others. Um, 
And so you can break it down into subcompartment based on you know, age, sex, race, activity, and so on. Um, but you quickly realize that this model with five age groups and sex and two different activity groups can lead to 80 compartments and it starts to be a little messy. And so, you know, we said that part of the attraction of a model is its simplicity. And so when you start to really break it down too much like that, then it's, it's still valid, but it's, uh, it's less simplified in some ways. Okay, so I'm gonna pause here, see if there's any questions I need to answer about the SIR model. I haven't looked at the chat. Um, and then I'm going to wrap up with some real world use of this SIR model. Should I continue? Let me just continue and then we'll come back to questions. And so before I get into the um, real world modeling using this SIR model, I just wanted to uh, talk about R0 or R0, which is the basic reproductive number. You might have heard about it uh, you know, in some briefings, uh, press briefings by the um, coronavirus uh, task force. So R0 is um, the number of people on average that each infected person will be infecting, assuming that you have a fully a susceptible population. And here in the United States and around the globe, most of the population is quasi, you know, fully susceptible. Very few people have already contracted it, even though, you know, all these alarming news in terms of uh, the overall population is still negligible. Uh, and so um, a person can infect another, only a single person, in which case you'll have a constant um, level of uh, infectious, infections uh, you know, every day. Uh, or a person might infect more than one person. Let's say if the person infects two people uh, and it might take four days to infect those two people, then those two people will infect another two people. So you quickly have already four people infected. These four people can infect another two people over a 40 window. So you quickly have now eight, and then you'll have 16, 32 and so on. So you'll have that exponential increase. And you can see that that will, uh, it's going in um, the direction of an epidemic. But if the R0, if one person only infects one or less people, less than one person, then um, the epidemic is not really going to take off. The epidemic is going to wind down. So it's not going to be a disease that's going to spread. Um, so um, knowing this R0 gives you a good sense as to how quickly the epidemic is going to spread. And one of the most um, notorious diseases in terms of spreading is actually measles. Uh, one person typically infects, 50, infects 15 others. And then those 15 others are going to infect another 15. And you see how this can really go very quickly. So this is all assuming nobody's vaccinated and the entire population is susceptible. Luckily for measles, most people are vaccinated. And so we don't see the kinds of outbra outbreaks that could potentially happen. And so on the scale of, you know, the, uh, how these diseases are contagious. COVID-19 is kind of um, at 2.8. So it's, it seems to be less contagious than seasonal influenza, which is at 1.3. So 1.3 people are going to be infected. It's above one. So there will be you know, an increase in the number of people over time. Um, but it, this one is not as dramatic as measles and it's less than COVID-19. Okay, so now um, going back to the SIR model, if you recall when this epidemic started in Wuhan, China, and then uh, one of the next big epicenters was actually Italy. Italy saw its first cases early on um, in um, that whole, the Bergamo, Milan region was really a big epicenter. 
But the first death happened in the city, the municipality of Vaux, which is not too far from Venice. And uh, people studied that epidemic. And uh, there was a paper that was published in Nature. Uh, it was received April the 2nd, 2020. So that was pretty early on in the course of the epidemic. And it was eventually accepted in June 23rd. So um, the goal of the study was um, to look at the prevalence of the infection. And at that time, you know, uh, a lot of people were flying blind. The extent of the epidemic was not really well understood. You know, tests were not uh, used uh, systematically as they now are. Uh, and so it was very important to really quickly get a sense of how many people are infected and how quickly does this um, disease spread and so on. And so on February 21st, 2020, they had the first COVID-19 related death in Italy in Vaux, in the municipality of Vaux. And so they uh, kind of tested everybody in that municipality or close to everybody in that municipality. They just took the, the nasal swabs and they um, RT-PCR assays, the classic uh, assays for COVID. And so they took the surveys during this period of time shaded in red, starting February 21st to February 29th. And on February 28th, and, uh, as they were taking these um, surveys, they went into lockdown for that municipality and they were on lockdown till March 8th. And on March 7, they also did another uh, second set of um, surveys. They swapped everybody in that municipality. Uh, and so this is kind of how they went about it. The number of residents were 3,275 residents, 2,812 or 85% were tested, most 97% were negative, and 73 were positive. And then this is the second survey uh, towards the end of the lockdown. They tested another 2,343. Uh, that's 71% of the population. And 29 or 1.2% were positive, 98.8 were negative. So these are their findings. And based on these findings, uh, when you plug in these numbers and see uh, how it matches with that theoretical curve, you can uh, find out a lot of things about you know, the course of the disease, especially when it wasn't. So one of the things they found out is that the R0 before lockdown was 2.49, and after lockdown, it was 0.41. So here's my chat question for you. Was the lockdown effective in reducing transmission of the disease? Yes or no? Okay, I see the, the yes coming in full force. Very good. Um, so yes, yeah, so before the lockdown, um, each person infected about two and a half people. Whereas after lockdown, um, it was well below one and there's a huge reduction in the R0. So normally R0 is really calculated before lockdown, before, you know, when 100% of the population is susceptible. Um, but here you can see clearly that R0 kind of drops. Uh, and when it's at 0.41, essentially the disease is dying out. Um, and so clearly the lockdown was very effective. They also established a few things such as the fact that uh, the infectious period was uh, between 3.6 and 6.3 days. And actually, this is their model. So they kind of tweaked that SIR model quite a bit. And they have their susceptible pool here. And then they have the exposed pool. So these are infected. But and they're, um, you know, when they take the swabs, the nasal swabs, and they do the RT-PCR test, they're not picking up um, the virus. So they're negative. They test negative. But they have been infected. And then they move to this asymptomatic, but detectable. So they, come, they become uh, positive when they're tested, but they're still asymptomatic. 
And actually, this is the group that is, uh, it seems, the most sort of um, responsible for infections. They say that um, the most infectious people are those people who, you know, uh, who are infected about a day or two before the onset of symptoms. And then they split them into two groups, the, the symptomatic group, because at that time they really didn't know how being symptomatic and asymptomatic really affected the, the transmission of the disease. So they split them between symptomatic and asymptomatic. So here are the asymptomatic. Um, and with um, these guys are uh, COVID positive. So they test positive and they're infectious. Whereas these, uh, are not infectious anymore, but still um, positive on the test. And then eventually everybody moves into the recovered group. And so this is another way of kind of tweaking the, um, that basic SIR model. Uh, and so with this, what they've been able to find out, you know, again, uh, at that time, one of their interests was to kind of really see how the dynamics will be played out for pre-symptomatic, symptomatic, asymptomatic. And so they shaded them, you know, they, they plotted them separately with the, um, the orange, the purple, and the green. Um, here is on March 17, when they're about to come out of the lockdown, a lot of things have gone down. And this is how they think um, the, the, the disease kind of went down over time after the lockdown on February and, 24th. And final slide here again. This is the trajectory they were in in blue. And then with the lockdown on February 24th, a lot of things went down. The number of cases went down uh, and kind of stayed steady like this. And they were on this trajectory. If there was no public measures and no lockdown, then this is the trajectory they would have followed. And as you can see, all this big peak has been averted. And so the epidemic final size, you know, the red peak essentially, would amount to somewhere around um, 80, 90% of the population getting COVID if nothing was done at all eventually by April 14 or so, 80 or 90% of the population would have gotten COVID. But now with the lockdown, only the blue, so it's only a few, um, one, two percent of the population that got COVID. And so as you can see, that lockdown is highly effective. And so with that, I will end the talk with the wise uh, words of Anthony Fauci, director of the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Models are as good as the assumptions you put into them. As we get more data, then we put it in and that might change. And so at the very beginning of the epidemic, um, there were a lot of unknowns, right? Some simple things such as, you know, how long would people be infectious and so on were not known. And sometimes when you give yourself a big window of, you know, it could be anywhere from four to 10 days, for example. Well, um, depending on whether you're running your model with four days versus 10 days, you can have very different outcomes. And so you have to adjust. And of course, you know, that big peak is always sort of the default peak. And students sometimes ask me, how many waves are you going to, are we going to get? Are we going to, you know, we're on to our first, second, third wave now. Uh, are we gonna be done? Well, I say the default is that one big curve, but as we take some public health measures, we kind of uh, interfere with it, try to, trying to bring it down. And until we get, you know, if there was no vaccine, if there was anything and nothing was done, then until we get to that, you know, the peak of the curve, which is when 50% of the population is um, infected, then, you know, the trend would be upward. And after that 50%, then the trend would be downwards. 
Okay, so with that, I'm ready to, to take in some of the chat questions. I have not been able to kind of follow all of it. Amen. Uh, this is quite quite interesting talk. Uh, there are some uh, uh, middle school, high school teachers in the crowd. I think some of them probably are interested in using your code and uh, uh, modify for their own school. So. Yeah, so uh, for teachers, what I would say is if you wanted to use the, this, um, this model, uh, you know, the script is ready to go. You don't have to download anything. All you have to do is use, um, it's online, uh, go to glowscript.org and I can provide you with the script. And by the way, we, we have uh, published uh, a paper on how to also implement something like this for college students. Um, and implement it across many uh, disciplines. So how computer science faculty can implement this, focusing more so on the script in the computer science, the coding part, how um, biology uh, people can, or public health people can, can use um, some of the scenarios. So we have really these wonderful scenarios that students uh, can, can can implement and simulate using the script. So uh, I'd be very, very happy to share uh, the script. So Hong, if you give me, you know, I'll send them to you and you'll post them wherever you need to post them and, and share them with the, the teachers. I can put, uh, put it on the event website, uh, put the link there. So. Okay, I can give you the script, yeah. Um, I guess, uh, do you have, uh, can you also share some slides or? Um, uh, yeah, so I'll have um, I'll have the scenarios described in some of the things that can be as uh, um, simulated using the script. Uh, I and I can give you these slides that I just um, showed today, right? Do you fun? have uh, do you have a lab manual or something like a lesson plan or student? Guide? Um, yeah, uh, I, I do have a worksheet, yeah. Oh, worksheet, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. You can also share with yeah. the, the teachers. Yeah, I do have a worksheet, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, there are also uh, some questions you look like you, you answered uh, during your talk. Uh, it, it's a very long chat list. I cannot even find things. <laughs> 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 yeah, so, you know, uh, yeah. I was not looking at the chat, but, you know, so, Maybe people can just ask um, their questions in, in, uh, yeah. in person so. if there's some unanswered questions. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I remember just, someone asking, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I remember someone asking what would happen if you uh, account for reinfection in the model. Yeah. Yeah. So then you'll have to tweak your model a little bit instead of S I R from R, you kind of draw an arrow where people trickle down, back down into the susceptible, right? For some diseases, you might only have immunity for a short period of time. So uh, you may not be immune for the rest of your life. So um, you will just have to also include an equation now that, um, that takes into account the fact that people go from recovered to susceptible again. So we're all looking forward to, to this vaccine. Um, you know, uh, at Spelman, after looking and watching Dr. Kizmeka Corbett talk about how this vaccine was developed, um, and also, you know, now hearing how effective these vaccines are, they, uh, they say that they're about 95% effective. So that means, um, we're going to be reading the very last scenario that I just modeled where kind of more and more of the student population would be in that recovered pool rather than the susceptible pool. Uh, and that's pretty effective vaccine. Um, and if you have, you know, we model just 50% of the student population being, being vaccinated, but if you have 80% um, or so of the student population vaccinated, you know, a lot of things would be really under control and hopefully we'll be able to move back to quasi-normal life. <laughs>
and hopefully, you know, we hope that um, there will be more drugs discovered and in case some people still catch the disease. Um, yeah, the, there's a lot of fascinating thing on the, the scientific front. Uh, and for those of you who are kind of coming of age and starting to, to, to go to the university while there's this disease outbreak, you know, a lot of things such as, you know, what's the impact of COVID-19 on um, the nervous system? You know, one of the symptoms is that people can't smell anymore. Uh, and why is that? How is that? And I've even heard of um, some people's really cognitive abilities being impacted. Um, and um, so, yeah, so there's still a lot of work to do and, and research to be done in this field. It's a brand new field for all of you who are getting started. All right, so I have a question about the script. So you wrote it, correct? Um, yeah, so I modified it from a previous script, yeah. All that right. We had written for, say that again? I said, all right. I was wondering because it looked like you came from a C-like language going into Python. Oh. Um, because it has some functions that look like, you know, I would do in C. Oh, example, okay. Uh, See, I'm not like a hardcore uh, computer scientist. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm, I, I'm not either. <laughs> I do it in my free time at school, but I have okay. written it as a function because I'm more articulated in Python and I've uh, posted it on GlowScript and it's in the chat, but I made some modifications to it so then be more efficient. For yeah, example, that's possible. So this is, uh, you know, there's so many different ways of coming up with a script. Um, you, you know, you can always tweak it in ways that you're most comfortable with, yeah. Well, yeah. I saw on like line 32 and 33 that you create a new variable and you iterate through it and which is not needed in Python because you can use for X in range as well as line 26 to like 20, oh no, I could just say and 27, but you declare them as floating point variables, which is not needed in Python as it will automatically convert. Maybe so, yeah. Um, yeah, this is a modified script from another original script that was um, written by a colleague, Dr. David Pitts. Yeah, yeah so yeah. we also try to make these as kind of easy to, to understand as possible. Obviously, you're, uh, you're a little bit more advanced and you kind of feel that these can be tweaked. So, but that's I, I posted it in the chat, but... Okay. To me, it just looks easier, you know, the way I wrote it because mm -hmm. it has less of these, you know, things that may, it, it's just simplified. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I have everything wrapped in one function, so you can just switch out the variables in the function rather than to have them hard-coded. Yeah. And you can yeah, I mean, you know, so this is really a starting point. And the idea um, with uh, this is that people who are more computer scientists, they can really tweak it and play with it, right? Um, the idea is that, you know, um, students who kind of get exposed to, to this topic in more of a computer science class can really critique it and say, well, this might be better. Uh, for example, for solving the, um, if we're numerical solve, solving, numerically solving the equations, we use the Euler's method. Um, one can discuss, for example, what are the, the kind of weak points of uh, the Euler method. So the more you break it down into, uh, you know, so the, the script runs for time that starts at zero and ends at 500. And for, we, we do 200 calculations between time zero, time 50. And so the more uh, time points you calculate, the more accurate the, um, the curves will be. 
but sometimes just to save computational power, uh, you can keep it lower and so on. So these are the kinds of discussions that a computer scientist can have with their students if they're kind of visiting the script. Okay. As or, you know, go ahead. Or, you know, they can just scratch it all together and say, I want to use R, you know? <laughs> okay. As a student, uh, how would I go about this? Because I'm not a teacher, nor do I have any teaching experience. Oh, yeah. So, so you know, uh, it may not be specifically for you, but I think uh, for um, college professors can really kind of incorporate some of this into their curriculum. Uh, we also know that there are um, high, um, high school teachers who are participating in this workshop. And so um, they can also use it as is. Or if they if they are comfortable with tweaking it, they can tweak it. Yeah. All right. I was just asking because I'm I'm not a teacher. I'm just here attending uh, the boot camp to learn about R. So. I think your your time will come in just a few minutes, where um, Dr. Chin is going to walk you all through that uh, R coding exercise you're going to engage in. All right. Sounds great. Yeah. We, we have people as young as 14 uh, and so. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, so this is certainly not just for adults. <laughs> yeah. I, I was wondering about that because I'm, I'm on the lower end. I'm, I'm 15 and we learn. Yeah. Uh, uh, the intention is the, the boot camp is just for exposure and uh, to, to let people know what is out there, what you can do with the write a few uh, line of code and uh, you can do some interesting things. Yeah. So, so, I, so I, will the boot camp have simulations of uh, epidemiological models or not? The boot camp has the optional material on uh, effective uh, transmission, reproductive number estimation, but that's actually, it's probably uh, only for very advanced students. We, um, the bootcamp is basically focusing on first getting the data, manipulating, visualizing, um, um, uh, dealing with the heterogeneous data set. Okay. It's a very basic one. So, okay, yeah. so it's more data wrangling. Yeah. So, okay. uh, some someone raised their hand. I forgot who, who that person is. Uh, can you can you speak up? Uh, yeah, give me a minute. I'm trying to remember what my question was. Um, if somebody else has a question, they can go ahead. Yeah, I have a question. Um, hello, professors, doctors. My name is Nicholas Dredgeus, and I'm a junior at the Mississippi School for Math and Science. Uh, first of all, thank you for having this presentation. It's been really informative. And my question is, is there a connection between SIR models and its variants and between machine learning models like k-nearest neighbors and decision trees? Like, is there any correlation there. So ah. there are very different approaches to modeling, right? Um, the SIR model is based on sort of the, the, the understanding, mechanistic understanding of transmission and recovery and you know, infections and recovery. Um, and for example, that uh, IHME model is really not um, mechanistic at all. Uh, it's just kind of correlating current data with historical data. So there are many different ways of uh, modeling. There are some models that are more so agent-based models and so on. So SIR is just one way of modeling. It's been you know, developed back in the 1920s and still a good model to a point where you know, I just showed you that, that uh, nature paper uh, modeling uh, COVID-19 uh, in Vo Italy is also based on that model. So. Yeah, so there are many different ways of modeling. I think Hong Chin was about to add something to this. Uh, so the popular way for machine learning is to estimate the parameter for the so-called deterministic mathematical model. So the SR model, SER model, those are all called the deterministic mathematical models. And the machine learning method is mainly to uh, uh, Based on the data, trying to estimate without clear assumptions. So the deterministic model, human has to put some insight into it. 
Now that said, that human often don't really know uh, specifically. You had uh, uh, what the best parameter to infer. Uh, so a common practice, uh, in fact, a CDC organized competition, what kind of a model can best predict the result? It turns out the best result is the combination of both deterministic model and a machine learning model. Um, now using machine learning based on the empirical data, you can estimate what are the, uh, the proper parameter for the determination model. Using the determination model, we can do a prediction in the near future. So combination of the two seem to be the, the winner of the CBC competition. Uh, actually, we have uh, Jessi uh, Dr. Jessica Koda, if she's still, <laughs> I'm not sure whether she's involved in that. <laughs> no. yeah. so, uh, is Hi. Um, so I actually, so I don't do SARS-CoV-2 modeling, but um, Dr. Chin is correct. So at least I use, um, I do modeling for mumps virus. And so those outbreaks are a lot less frequent and rely more on like stochastic dynamics. And using stochastic dynamics, we really pull from a lot of statistical and probability theory that also kind of helps drive machine learning. I don't have the data set because mumps again is so rare to do something um, as far as like machine learning algorithms, but there is a lot of um, interplay between some of those traditional standard methods that we've had over time and the uh, more advanced like machine learning and AI best based methods that people are getting really, really excited about now. Uh, oh, okay, uh, let's uh, please complete the uh,